thank you all very much for being here tonight, and a special thank you to all the Tennessee Young Writers out there for Yay. making it to Wednesday.
Um, and books like that made me realize that I could, I could do the same thing. I could write about home um, and, and make it meaningful. And I could share my mountain heritage while at the same time um, touching on issues and problems that people have everywhere and not just in Appalachia. Uh, and I think, you know, when Ludwig was published last year and I went on my book tour um, and I had the opportunity to travel outside of the South for the first time, really, um, it was really gratifying to see how much people outside of the area do care what we have to say. Uh, my editor, who's a New Yorker, says that we're exotic here in Tennessee, which I think is funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I think I kind of understand what she means. Um, I think she really, she's enjoying reading about a culture in a place that, that's unfamiliar to her. And so New York is exotic to me, so. Um, but, you know, when a writer comes along with a different and unique perspective, readers really do want to hear it. Um, last, last summer, I was kind of surprised when the New York Times called me up and wanted to, um, to write an editorial. I wondered what in the world you know they could possibly um, want to hear from me. But um, the editor said, the, uh, the opinion page editor said that um, most writers are from four square blocks in Brooklyn. So when a writer comes along from a different, unique place, um, you know, he really wants to hear what you have to say. Um, so just keep in mind that your that your point of view as a Tennessean is, is as important and worthy of being heard as anybody else's. Um, there's also a misconception, I think, maybe especially in Appalachia, that it's impossible to have a career as a writer or in the arts in general. Um, I think of my dad, who is who's an amazing painter. He's wonderful, but he would never have considered going to art school because he would have thought of, he would have thought of it as impractical. So he ended up working in a furniture factory um, for decades until he retired, doing a job that he hated. Um, so I, I stand here as living proof that it is possible to pursue your passion and to do what you truly love to do for a living. Just keep at it. Um, and you know, as I mentioned before, it's also possible to write about your own neck of the woods um, and to write what you know, that cliche um, thing to say, but it, it really is true. Um, for instance, I used the folklore that I grew up hearing as a major inspiration for my writing. Um, uh, my parents are natural storytellers, and they, they always they told me, you know, all the, the stories about about growing up. My mom uh, used to tell me about her aunt who would take off her warts by rubbing stones in a circle around each one and throwing the stones away. And I was also warned never to pick up a bag along the road because it might have some nice warts in it. So that's what I, I could pass on to you. <laughs> I never pick up a bag of words. Um, and my mom, she also had a witch living down the road from her name, Holby, who would read the neighbors in the coffee grounds at the bottoms of the neighbors' cups. Um, and I named the, the witch in Blood Root Land, and she's the one who puts a curse on her family that won't be lifted until there's a baby born in their line with paint blue eyes. Um, so, you know, I used a lot of, a lot of my personal, um, the stories and inspiration from where I come from, in my mountain heritage. Um, and, and one of my favorite scenes in Blood Root to Ride is where Clifford blows down Brady's throat to heal her thrush. And that's based on a story that my dad tells about his mom taking his baby sister to the man in the neighborhood who'd never laid eyes on his father and having him to heal her thrush that way. And this lady in the front seems to know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and no, but most people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that, but, but not her. <laughs> Um, so we'll talk after. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but it was just such a striking thought and a striking image to me. Um, and so I actually wrote about that in Blood Root. And um, I'm going to close with that passage. And then after I finish reading, um, y'all have to ask me questions or we'll all be embarrassed. Because I'll have to here and you know, start calling on you or something. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to close with this passage from. The grandmother of Birdie is part of the book, and she is being raised, and this is when she was a little girl, she's being raised by her mom and her, her aunts, her three aunts who are, who are called grand women. Um, and one morning, she wakes up with thrush, or the thrush as she calls it. One morning, I woke up with the thrush. My mouth was broke out so thick with sores, I couldn't hardly swallow. Della said, hey, but one thing will take care of this. Mammy was standing over my bed looking worried. What, she asked. 
a man that's never laid eyes on his father. Who will we take her to? Myrtle asked, standing in the doorway with her hand on her hip. She looked blurry to me. My mouth hurt so bad I couldn't see straight. Clifford Pinkston's the closest, Grandma said, leaning over to rub my hair. You can't tell me Clifford Pinkston never seen his daddy, Manny said. I went to school with him and I've seen his daddy my own self a hundred times. Howard Pinkston ain't Clifford's daddy, Grandma said. She was done getting her headscarf on. He was an orphan and the Pinkstons took him to raise. She turned back to me and when she smiled I felt a little bit better. Come on, she said. We'll get you fixed up right quick. Clifford just lives down the hall a piece. I'd seen Clifford's house before on the way to other places. It was about two miles from ours, perched on the edge of a bluff near the bottom of the holler. A weathered three-story with a boarded-up window on the top floor and a wraparound porch that sagged down in the back, overlooking a patch of rocky farmland. There was always goats and geese and peacocks strutting around in the yard. In winter, I could see his chimney smoke puffing up through the trees. Grandma told me on the walk that he lived by himself because he was too backward to get him a woman. Mammy said she didn't believe he ever said two or three words when they was in school together. What makes you think he'll help us, Mammy asked. Well, Clifford's always been a good neighbor, Grandma said. He was out in the yard splitting wood when me and Mammy and Grandma came up. He took off his hat when he seen us. My mouth hurt too bad to think about much, but I took note of the fine figure Clifford cut when he stood up straight. He was long and tall with strong brown arms. I could see his muscles with the sleeves of his shirt rolled up. When we got close, my nerves went away because of how kind his face was. Hello there, Clifford, Grandma said. Hiding the fruit, he said. Then he nodded to Mammy. His face and ears turned red. How are you making it, Clifford, Mammy said. It's been a long time since we was in school together. She smiled and I pictured her as a girl. It crossed my mind that Clifford might think she was pretty. It made me feel funny to think of my Mammy as a woman and not just as the one who bore me. I wasn't used to seeing her around men her own age. My daddy died when I was a baby, so I didn't remember them being together. This in here's got the thresh, Grandma said, and set me out in front of him by the shoulders. I was hoping we could trouble you to help us out. The way Clifford looked at Mammy, I know he wouldn't refuse her anything. Then he looked down and studied me real good. I felt a warmness spreading in my heart like I never knew before. He had the kindest eyes I'd ever seen. He seemed familiar to someone. I had the queerest thought that he was my daddy, even though I know my daddy was dead. He knelt down before me so our faces was close. I could smell his sweat where he'd been working in the heat. I stood still as I could, waiting to see what would happen. He took hold of my face so gentle, and it was like I always needed to be touched that way by a man's fingers after all the years being by women. Open your mouth, Bertie, Mammy said. Her voice was thick and fuzzy, like it sounded when she woke up in the mornings. It seemed to me like the world had quit turning, and Mammy must have felt it too. I did as she said, and Clifford leaned in to cover my lips with his own. He blowed warm wind in my mouth and down my swelled up throat. I could feel my lungs filling up with it. It was such a relief somewhere that I wanted to squall. He pulled back from me, still holding my face, and we looked for a while in each other's eyes. It seemed like even the birds in the trees had quit making noise. Then Grandma said, well, I ought to do it. I looked up at her and Mammy standing over us. Mammy's face was white as a sheet. She was staring at Clifford with something like worship in her eyes. She felt the power of what he'd done the same as I did. Thank you. Like Lacey, who confiscated somebody's laser pointer back there. I'm going to touch. Okay. Uh, I'll kick it off. Okay, good. You read Cold Mountain? I was wondering what your analysis was. He asked if I've, if I've read Cold Mountain and I thought of it. Um, and actually, I, I loved Cold Mountain. And um, when I when I first wrote Blizzard, um, it was it was kind of an influence in a way on me. Um, and what was really interesting is my agent, I actually, 
Um, I was referred to her by Jill McCorkle, who's another great uh, writer from North Carolina, and I had met Jill at Sawani, and she um, she told me about this agent, Lee Feldman, and I, I, didn't, I had no idea who this person was, and I looked her up online, and I saw that she represented Charles uh, Charles Fraser, who wrote Cold Mountain, and, and that was when I knew that, you know, this was the agent that I loved him, <laughs> because I knew, I knew what that meant. Um, so I absolutely love it. I think that uh, Cold Mountain is sort of this sprawling kind of take on the Odyssey, and um, and it's a very classic, very classic tale. Um, and and I think that's that's why I loved it because it's an epic. It's a true epic. So right up there with my all-time favorite books. Would love to shake his hand someday. You didn't comment on the dialogue at all. I'm just curious about your take on it. I thought it. I mean, for me, from what I can remember, it's been years since I read it. But I know that it, I, I think he's one of those authors who doesn't do the quotes. Right. Yeah. Which, for me, somebody, I heard it put that somebody, uh, somebody said that it's only polite to kind of, you know, observe that rule and, and be polite to the reader and put the quotes around the dialogue. Right. But in a way, I, what I remember about it is that it was seamless and it did flow and you were never taken out of the story. And so what that says to me is that he did a fine job with, with the dialogue. Um, and, and when you don't notice, I think sometimes it can be considered sort of as a device if, if, they, if you're leaving out the quotation marks and whatever. But I think I understand why he did that. Because it, it was, his dialogue was part of the story. It was all of a piece. Well, in fairness to him, he used a long dash as every time. He did use the dashes, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? McCarthy's part that does that too, right? That McCarthy does, does that, and I wonder if, I really feel like Charles Frazier had to be influenced by a Cormac McCarthy in some way. I think his influence, I think you can see it in a lot, in a lot of writers who do that, and I think his is, I think that was the, he was the first writer who I ever saw do that. Um, and it's a little bit startling, um, but then as you get into it, you, you, you realize, you know, it feels right. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to follow up. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the origins of this novel? Did it begin in, in character, in conception of plot, in scene or image? Where did it start? You And then how long was the process of completing the novel? Okay. Um, uh, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is if I did a lot of research before I started writing Blender. And the truth is that I didn't. I really just, um, it started with this image I had of this woman who, who became Myra, you know, this kind of the lead character, the heroine of this book. But it really just started with this image I had of this woman um, hiding in the mountain woods with her twins from some kind of danger. And I was really intrigued by the thought of it. And so, I, but I didn't, I, I knew she would be the heart of the story, this woman that I, I had envisioned, but I didn't begin with her. I actually, started writing these sort of elaborate character sketches of these other characters whose lives she turned upside down, you know? And so I ended up, before I got to Myra, and I really didn't know if the story was going to involve or not. I was just really exploring the characters. So I ended up with this sort of mess of, you know, voices that I was going to have to now, because the story did start to emerge, that I was going to have to tie up into this cohesive novel. Um, and that was a, a major task. And I kind of fought to hang on to, to those multiple narrators a little bit. I didn't get too much resistance, but um, my agent was right in one case, and she wanted me to absorb. I, I've had, um, if you've read the book, there is Bertie, who's the grandmother, and then there was another character, Mr. Barnett, who's sort of this older, wise character. So he was doing the same job as Bertie. So you know, he, he lost his voice. But, um, but I really felt like that all the voices were important you know, in telling the story. Um, and I was kind of on fire in that beginning stage that when, you know, that's the most fun part for me when you just get it out on paper. And I was in that, and that was really fast. And I have these sloppy, horrible notebooks that are falling apart, and they're just full of pieces of letter. Um, so that was the fun part that didn't take very long. And then the task of, you know, pulling it together, making it readable, making it publishable, um, I think altogether, the first draft of Blooded probably took about a year, but the editing process took a whole other year, and I consider that definitely part of the process of writing Blooded. Um, so I think altogether about two years. Yeah. 
What writing, if any, did you do before the novel? Um, she asked me what what writing I did before the novel, and letter is the first thing I've ever had in print. <laughs> so, so not a lot. Um, and that's been one of the interesting things is that you know I've, I've had sort of I've been writing since I was in the first grade, really, since I learned to read. I've, I've, I have all of my stories in like these Rubbermaid boxes in the basement of about princesses and like fleas on dogs and all this crazy stuff. So, um, and so I've always written, but, and I think Bloodroot was kind of the story that was in me, you know, all along. And because I've, I've seen the complexity of, of living in Appalachia, the beauty and the harshness, I've seen it all. And so um, I think that's what came out when I really sat down to try to write something, almost like a love letter to home. Um, Bloodroot's what came out. So I think it's always been there. But, you know, and before that I would try, I would try to, because I had this idea that you had to write short stories. Um, you had to be able to do that in order to get an agent, I don't know. I had these crazy notions, so I would try my hand at them and I was terrible. I hate them. They're always terrible. So, um, but then, you know, since I wrote Bloodroot, I have been kind of challenged to write in other, you know, to write for magazines and to do these other things. And so, um, which terrifies me every time. Like when the New York Times calls, I freak out. Yeah. <laughs> but I love to write novels and don't like to write them. So since Bloodroot, I've had other things in print. I had to kind of challenge myself to write essays and, and other genres. Um, but the novel will always be my first love and my passion. So. <laughs> I, there's somebody back there who has their hand up. I was going to ask if this was the first novel you tried to write. No, no. Yes, I went to, um, I had, and that's something else I really want to stress is that all the stuff that you're working on now, you know, that these young writers are, are working on, it's all part of the process of getting to the point where you do write something publishable. None of it's in vain. So I do, I, I did have this attempt at a novel, um, and when I realized it wasn't going anywhere, I, I felt a sinking, you know, sensation and a letdown, and I was disappointed. But now I look back on that, and I think that the fact that I got to the point where I could realize it wasn't going anywhere was a really good thing. Um, that was part of my growth. Uh, and and it, I got so much out of it, and it taught me so much. And I went to the Duke Writers Workshop, and Lynn York was, um, was my workshop leader there. And I had taken that part of that first, that first novel that I've been working on, and I really had an epiphany. You know, when I was sitting in that workshop, I just, and from listening to Lynn and talking to other writers, because it really was my first exposure to other writers, probably what like these young writers are having here, is where you, you're really, for the first time, around people who love to write as much as you do, and you're having these conversations, and you're part of this community all of a sudden. And I really, it was really a turning point for me, because I did realize there that, you know, it, this wasn't the novel that, that was going to see print. And that was okay, you know. And so I went home and started working on Bloodroot, actually, immediately, because I started to realize where my heart was and what I really wanted to do. And, and you know, Bloodroot came out, it didn't come out whole, but, you know, it, it was my heart and soul on paper. And I think I had to write, I had to work on that other novel first to get to the point where I could put my heart and soul on paper in the form of Bloodroot. When you get stuck writing a novel, what did you do to get more inspiration to keep writing? That's a really good. That's a really good thought and a really good question, Jeff. Like when you get stuck, what do you do to, what do you do to get over to get unstuck? <laughs> and I think it's okay to. I think it's okay to put it down for a little while and get some perspective. I think it's you know you have to be careful. Like no more than three days, <laughs> maybe. Um, but what happened to me with Flutter? I think about using other mediums too to kind of inspire me because um, my husband is, is in the back of the room and one of the um, best things he ever did for me was I kind of got to this point with Blood Root where I felt really empty and I, I had no idea what to do and I was, I, one of the luxuries of being a young writer is that you're not under a deadline but I had to, I had to deliver, you know, a Blood Root, I had to deliver an edit and so it was um, really scary to kind of feel that kind of blocked dry way, you know. And so um, my husband actually made me a CD, it was like a mix CD of, of music. He made me the Bloodroot soundtrack. Oh, right. <laughs> so I just went in my room and closed my eyes and listened to the listened to music. And it really, really like opened something up for
for me emotionally. So I would say um, read, a, read a great book, watch a, an awesome movie, listen to beautiful music, and you'll feel it. You'll start to feel it. Make the soundtrack of your novel. <laughs> Was it the music of Appalachia, or was it? Not really. It was, it, it was just beautiful music. It was just a mix. And and because Adam had read the book and was so as invested in it as I was and knew it so well, he, he chose the perfect songs, and they, you know, kind of spoke to the themes and, and the characters. And so it was just, it was exactly what I needed. So now I use music a lot when I feel kind of, you know, dry <laughs> and feel like the well is dry. I kind of try to listen to something that inspires me or watch something that inspires me. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, like a set amount of writing you do every day. Um, I actually, I probably should be more disciplined than I am, but I, so far, I've trusted myself just to, I think there are days where I might write for 12 hours. There are weeks where I might write every day and just exhaust myself. And I feel like it's okay as long as I have those bursts of productivity to, lie, to let it lie fallow a little bit for a little while as long as I get back on the course at some point. So I just kind of, I really try to write when I'm feeling it. Um, and, you know, and of course when it's been too long, then I, then I do try to do something to get myself going again. But I don't, I'm not disciplined. I don't tr treat it like a job. I would, be, I would be a terrible employee anywhere because I, I'm just like, well, just have however the wind blows. That's how, you know. So I just really kind of play it by ear and I'm really flaky about it. Yeah. Um, in Blender, you have a lot of different you know, points of view. You talked about this a little bit, but and it kind of goes, you know, it jump forward in time or back in time. Um, can you just kind of talk to us about that and like how you kind of, well, to kind of manage that timeline, because it was, that was one of the really hard parts. But in the end, when I had all these voices and all these, you know, these kind of elaborate character studies, my task was to piece them together in a way that made sense. And it was almost like putting a puzzle together at the end. My advice is always get it out first and worry about the details later. Um, and then, you, you, you know, it's hard when you work that way. But I really had to go back and, and make a, a timeline. I had to do all this in the editing process. Um, because those little details will, can really take the, the reader out of the world you're trying to create. So, you know, you, you do have to be careful about that. Um, and, you know, jumping back and forward in time, the flashbacks, that's something I'm really having to deal with in the second novel that I've been working on. Because I had this idea somehow that the second novel would be a breeze to write. Um, and it's been harder than letters, actually. And one of the reasons is because I'm dealing with how to incorporate backstory and how to, you know, how to move back in time. And, um, and really, for me, I think there's no, there's no trick. You kind of have to play it by ear and, and figure it out as you go. And it does help to have a, a, a second pair of eyes, you know, somebody who's, who's your reader to make sure that you're, you know, that it's making sense. Um, but it really, really, it really was a huge task at the end to try to get the chronology right and, and to go back and forth. Um, somehow it worked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you think the success of your first novel is pressuring the development of your second novel? Well, when I was writing the first draft, I didn't feel it. But now that I'm taking these steps toward, you know, publishing the second novel, I'm starting to feel it a little bit. I, I start these little words like sophomore slump or whatever they call it, <laughs> sophomore curse, whatever, start kind of creeping into the back of my mind. So I think when I'm in these, because what's happening now with the second novel is I'm going back and forth with my editor and having these exchanges with her. And right now she has the novel and I've had some time away from it. So I think that's when, when I'm not at the business of writing and when I'm not doing the work, it's when all those you know, those thoughts start to creep in. But I think it's so important, and I think, I think that's okay and it's natural. But I think the important thing is to be able to get, you know, push all that aside and get back down to business when the time comes. So when my editor gets back to me with the notes on the second novel, then I won't let myself think about sophomore slump. <laughs> but th there definitely is pressure. 
And I, you know, I do worry because I think you kind of have a responsibility to, to readers who have, because I've gotten so many wonderful letters from people who have read the letters and told me what it meant to them. And that's when you start to see that as a writer, you have a responsibility to readers. If you think about the fact that thousands of people are going to be reading your book, um, and you start to think about what you're putting out into the world, and I want to be a force for good, you know, and I want to put positive energy into the world. So, you know, there's a pressure with that too, I think. Because when I was writing Blundered, I was in a little bubble and I never thought about anything like that. Um, and I sort of envy all you writers who don't have to worry about that yet. Um, and you're just, you know, you don't have anybody to answer to and you can do whatever you want. Um, but really, for me, writing it has been a thing that's always saved me. And it's, it's the one thing that's been with me my whole life. So I can retreat into writing even from those pressures. And it could be my escape even from that. So. And, and you had a question at one point. <laughs> okay, um, the word paint, you use that a lot. Yeah. You know, like painted and paint blue. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, what, what exactly does that mean? Because I'm just not familiar yeah. with that term. Okay, the, the term paint. That's another question I get. I should really clear that up right up front always. I should just get up right and read and say, let me tell you what hang is. <laughs> um, um, but a hang is a spirit. And um, I actually kind of made up the whole hang for last thing. But, um, and hang blue is this, this color that is supposed to ward off evil spirits because spirits aren't supposed to be able to cross water. So um, it, it's supposed to mimic water and, and scare spirits away. And if you drive around the back roads in, in East Tennessee, I know probably in other parts of the country, you'll see doors and window sills painted this kind of aqua color, especially on old houses. Um, and that's what's so beautiful to me about Appalachia is that there's still that kind of magic that exists, you know, in the mountains. And um, and that's part of it, just part of that, that folklore that was, um, that mysticism. And the fact that it still lives and that people still practice it, that, um, that so intrigued me and, and was a huge inspiration for me and Ron and Butter. Which character is your favorite to write about? Well, most people expect me to say Myra because she's, you know, she is the sort of heroine of the story. But actually her son, Johnny Odom, uh, is, my, is my favorite character. And I think part of the reason that he's my favorite character is because I made him and his twin sister, Laura, my own age. Um, and he started to become a writer. It, it felt like almost against my will as I was writing about him. Uh, because it's, there are inherent challenges involved in being a writer, writing about writers. It's really hard to do well. Um, but I think, I think you can't help but have a little bit of autobiography to slip into you know, your writing no matter what you're writing. And so I think that was just my own understanding of the power of words and of books that couldn't help you know, seeping in there. And, and I actually, um, once I had all the character sketches done, the first scene that I ever wrote for, um, for Bloodroot was, was with Johnny. And um, there was this abandoned house I used to pass on the way to my sister's that uh, was just fascinating me. It was up on a hill. And one day I got out of the car and I stood um, in the weeds beside the road and took pictures of the house. and. Um, and I, I think it was like a week or so later, I was folding clothes or something like that. And it occurred to me that that was the house that my characters lived in. Um, and because, maybe because I did put some of Johnny, you know, some of myself into him, he's the character that I put in my place, you know, standing in the weeds looking up at the abandoned house. So the first, I guess, you can't say chapter because it's not a five the chapter, but the first thing that I ever wrote was from Johnny's point of view. and. Um, you know, he's sort of a dark character. He's a little bit of a violent character. But for me, he's, he's the hope of the, of the story. You know, when I was talking to you earlier about um, that misconception that you can't, uh, that maybe if you're from Appalachia, if you're from a certain part of the world, that you can't um, do what you want to do. You can't overcome your circumstances if you're impoverished or, or what, you know, if you're, um, I don't know, if you're just a, someone who is not expected to succeed. Um, I think also, I think I stand here as living proof that you can, because my background is similar to my character's background. And I really, really wanted to show that with Johnny, that he's sort of the hope of, of the novel. Anything else? Yeah. How much rejection would you say Blood had to face before it got published? 
Well, I hate this question. <laughs> she asked me how much rejection did I have to face with blood group for her I'll tell you why I hate it, because it's not typical. Um, and, it, and it gives the wrong kind of message, I think. As somebody told me, never tell aspiring writers this. But I, I didn't face any rejection with Blender at all. It was never rejected. It was never rejected once. <laughs> but but that, that's not a typical. I got so lucky in that way. And and rejection is, you know, to be expected. And it doesn't mean anything about if Blender had been rejected a hundred times, it wouldn't have meant anything about the quality of it. I really don't I really think that every good book will find a home. You know, if you really are writing from a beautiful you know, a pure place and you are writing what you really, really want to write, and, and, it's, and you know, I think it will, it will find a home. But um, what happened with me is that I actually, you all are doing the right thing by co going to conferences and workshops. That's something I always recommend that um, aspiring writers do. Because I went to uh, the Sewanee Writers Workshop in Sewanee, Tennessee, and that's something for I think they have a young writers workshop too. There's so, that's something for when you're an adult to to think about. Um, but I went there, and, and as I was telling. I was telling you that I um, met Jill McCorkle there. She was my workshop leader. And she saw enough promise in the, the rough draft of Blood Root that she told me when I finished it, she'd put me in touch with an agent. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was about 50 pages away from finished at the time. And I came home and finished it really fast so she wouldn't forget that she said that. <laughs> and then, um, and I, I, first I told her that I was ready, and then she put me in touch with an agent that she knew, Lee Feldman, that I earlier um, and that was that was just very shortly after Sawani just a couple of months after Sawani um, and then the day before I, I turned 32 I was at Dollywood don't judge <laughs> I make my annual birthday pilgrimage to Dollywood <laughs> so I, was, I was at Dollywood and Lee Feldman who is you know this New York powerhouse agent called me on my cell phone while I was at Dollywood so I had to go hide away from the music <laughs> and everything. And I, I thought I wouldn't be sophisticated if I was a Dollywood. But anyway, she um, and she offered to represent me while I was there. But um, the train came through and the whistle blew really loud, so, <laughs> like a jiggle up. And she asked me if I was on a train, so I had to tell her where I was. <laughs> but but then you know within so what she, what Lee explained to me was that she was going to send Blood Root to a list of ten major publishers. And she gave me the list, and she said, if you hear from me within, you know, a week. She asked me if I wanted to hear everything. Do you want the rejections, you know, too? And I said, yes, I want to know the whole process and be part of it. So she said, well, it usually takes about a month for the editors to get back to you. So if you see my number on your call ID before, you know, the week is up or before a month is up, then it's probably going to be a rejection. So uh, it wasn't even a week had passed. and. You know, her number came up on the car ID, so I was prepared. I was going to be great with rejection. I was going to be okay. Um, so I answered the phone, and she said, you know, we had a very interesting offer from um, Robin Desser at Knopf, which was, which is really my dream publisher because they published Cormac McCarthy and Tony Morrison and some of my absolute favorite writers. And um, she told me that Robin had made a preemptive offer to acquire Blender which meant that she felt so strongly about it that she wanted to take it. She wanted us to withdraw the manuscript from consideration everywhere else. And that was that was the absolute best thing because what it meant was she she was the person, the, the person to, to work with on this book because she loved it. You know, she truly loved it. And so that was um, just a, a beautiful thing that happened. And, but it's not typical. And most of the time, you know, writers do face a lot of rejection. And, and you know, that's and I didn't have a lot of experience. If I had, if I had had a lot of experience at trying to publish short stories and you know trying to get other things in print, then I would have had to deal with a lot more rejection. Oh. Any talk of a movie? Any talk of a movie? Well, there has been, but uh, you know I don't get my hopes up about that sort of thing because it's such a that is such a long process. Um, I had a. At, right after Blooder came out, I had a producer who contacted my agent who contacted me and you know and talked about that sort of thing. But um, you know, I just I try not to get excited about that. I try not to start casting it in my head. <laughs> Johnny Depp would make an excellent job. Oh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> all that you know, back in the room. So. Anybody else? Uh, you talk a lot about these character sketches and how they helped you kind of mold the book. Could you explain kind of what you include in those? Mm -hmm. You should ask me 
thinking about character sketches and what do you include in a character sketch. And I guess when I say that, I really just started writing about their lives. I had an, I had a, an image and a thought of who they were, and that's why I think it's so important to experiment and to not and to really realize that nobody ever has to see what you're what you're writing. You know, so it's it's private, it's yours. And so I really just experimented and kind of got into. Um, I wish I had the notebooks with me. I would show you. I really, I didn't even know their names. I think sometimes people get hung up on character names and kind of use that as an excuse to not write the story. You can plug in, you know, any word in the world in place of a name until you figure out the name. But, um, so, so like I didn't even know Myra's name for a long time. I just called her the mother. I knew she was the mother of the, of the twins. And so, um, I just wrote, you know, I wrote about them. I wrote about what they loved. I wrote about things that had happened to them, what they looked like and really, really just kind of got to know those characters like they were real people. And to this day, I really kind of think of them as real people. Um, I have a lot of people that ask me, you know, and say, because I, you don't tie, I didn't tie up leather with a neat little bow, you know, and there are a lot of, I wanted to kind of let the story have life beyond the pages, but, you know, people are always asking me if there's going to be a sequel, but I say, no, I know what happens to them, but I'm not going to tell anybody else. But, um, because they're, you know, they're like people to me. And I think that's really important you know, especially in a character-driven book like Letter, because, you know, I waited to see what would happen with the story, but it was really, really important to know and love those characters. Yeah. Did this story burn and churn, and then you finally had to spit it out? It was, it was more like it burned on paper, you know? When I was in that sort of experimental phase, there would be times that my, I had this horrible callus on my finger, because I write longhand in a notebook. And there would be times that I would write until my hand was injured almost. And, and so I didn't let it um, burn too much inside because sometimes I think it can burn out if you do that. Um, and if you're waiting for the right moment, it's never going to come. So, um, and I also think if, if, if you have too much of a vision sometimes, you're going to disappoint yourself. Um, like the vision can sort of become a prison almost if you're just too... Um, because you're never going to be you know, going to satisfy yourself. So. Well, what was the catalyst? What made you finally, finally sit, sit down, down and, and start? Well, like and I said, I had, I, I had the image, you know, I had the, the, the images or these sort of abstract thoughts in my mind about what I might want to write about. And I'll tell you what really got me started was reading Oral History by Lee Smith. Mm -hmm. And it was, and that's why I say those, there are those moments of inspiration. Use those wonderful books that other people have written those kind of outside things. Well, or you never, you know, you never really know when you're going to catch fire and really feel inspired to write. But it was while I was reading that book that I, and I, you know, I had, as I said, I read Cormac McCarthy and, and kind of had this notion that I could write about home. Um, and then I read Old History and Lee Smith, and she writes um, from the point of view. She she writes a multiple, like a multiple narrators. And so I just saw that I could do it. I think you have to have confidence sometimes, and you can get your you can get confidence from these places outside of you. And so I think that was what I needed was that I could do the thing to see that I could do the thing that I I wanted to do with it. So that was really what motivated me to get started. Yeah. Is there a reason you choose the right longhand? Yeah. Well. The first draft longhand because it feels intimate to me somehow. It feels like um, there's less of a barrier between me and the story and the, and the paper. And I can really just, I, always, I sit in my bed and, you know, with the cover pulled up and really write. And, and I feel um, there's something just cold about that blinking cursor, you know. <laughs> but when you, when you get to, you know, the polishing stage, then, of course, technology is very useful and I'm a big, you know, advocate of technology, but in that very first beginning stage when you really get to know your character and your story, I mean, for me, it's really important to have that pen to paper kind of tactile, in that intimate feel. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Go ahead. Do you have anything that you'd be willing to tell us about your next book? Sure, yeah. Um, my next book is, so far, it's called Long Man. What the Cherokees called the Spirit of the Tennessee River, and um, it takes place during the Depression in the Tennessee Valley, and uh, it's really 
interesting this time because I didn't come up with the characters first. And this was a case where I kind of had this thought about what would happen if a little girl went missing from a town um, before it was about to be flooded by a dam. And so I found myself, you know, telling these, telling this sort of intimate story against this big backdrop of the, I don't know if you, if you're familiar with the Tennessee Valley Authority, but in my town we have Cherokee Lake, and when the water goes down, you can see the tops of silos and these roads that are going under the water, and um, you know, there was a town there once. And so I started thinking about all the history that was lost under that lake, but then at the same time, you know, it, it's not this black and white issue because I've benefited directly from the TVA and that dam because you know, my parents worked in the factories that came along as a result of the dam and, and our, their lives were made easier. So, um, but what I found myself doing is telling this intimate story against a bigger backdrop with these kind of bigger questions. So it kind of is a story with two levels. Um, and it's been really hard because I think that the reason maybe it's been harder than writing Blender is because I have a little girl and, and so it really took me a long time to get past this block of not wanting to put myself in the mother's situation and, and write from that point of view, something that was really, really wrenching for me to even think about. Um, and so I really had to kind of prepare myself emotionally to do that. And that's not something, that's something that kind of comes with time. So I had to write my way through that. So it's been through a lot of drafts and it's been through a lot of work with my editor to get it. And she is a really good editor because she keeps pushing me to do better and to go to those places that I I'm a little bit afraid to go to. So it's been exhausting and grueling. I'll be so glad I'm over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so tired of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? One more? Um, you say this new book takes place in the Depression. So have you been having to do more historical research this time around than you did for Blood Yeah, Absolutely. That's, you know, that's a thing that's been different too, is that it's really, you know, I, because I have, have kind of pulled the camera back, so to speak, and, you know, Bloodroot is this character, these character studies, and it's a very intimate story, and with this one, I really had to be accurate, because, you know, you think about those details that can take the reader out of the story that you're trying to keep them, you know, invested in, so things have to be right to an extent, and so, you know, that for me has been the hardest part, because I really do just like to sit down and without thinking about all that stuff. But, you know, in this case, I really had to do, you know, quite a bit of research and try to find the right balance between research and story and not get too bogged down in it and not to have too much of it because the characters in it kind of have to be the beating heart and the driving force of the story. So that's been a challenge for me, actually. That's been a little bit like school when I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that part. Okay, well, I, I really, really love talking to y'all. And I guess I'm going to sign the letter, right, Lacey? Yes. Um, sign copies? There will be books for sale out here, and Amy will be signing books for young writers that do have books. And I would, of course, like to thank Amy Green, and I would also like to extend a thank you to Susan Wallace and Christopher Barrara of the Center for Excellence of New Creative Arts. I always mix up that Thank you very much.